Good afternoon, everybody. Well, what a brilliant and uplifting afternoon we have all had. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I've had conversations with people uh, that I haven't spoken to for a year, which has been fantastic. So um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. However, when I was teaching Sunday school this morning um, of the lesson of the four friends carrying the one friend to the feet of Jesus, did I ever imagine that I would be reenacting that uh, lesson in front of my Sunday school students in the middle of the exhort? But uh, thanks be to God that uh, Annie Avril's okay. Now, our theme for this year is Watch and Pray. And to help us and remind us of what to watch for, we have, thankfully, Uncle, our brother, Jim Cowie, to talk to the topic, Signs of Christ's Soon Return. So we'll start this afternoon with him, 376, followed by prayer. Our loving God, we praise your great name. We come now to study your word tonight and compare your amazing prophecies with what we see going on around us. Please be with our brother Jim and Nathaniel tonight and with us all that you would help us to remember and to be excited by the nearness of your son's return. We thank you so much for this opportunity to all join together and meet together again. And we now leave this night in your care, giving praise to your great name through your son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As an introduction, um, we're going to have Brother Nathaniel Wiggs will come forward and read for us Ezekiel 38 verse 1 to 13, and then I'll invite Uncle Jim to come up after that. Thank you. Reading with you, Ezekiel 38 verses 1 to 13. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back, and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, 
and all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Goma and all of his bands, the house of Togoma of the north quarters, and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall also come to pass, that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. To take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, and to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Thanks for that fine reading of a very familiar passage, and thank you, Brother Josh, for the introduction. Brothers and sisters and young people, what a year last year was, 2020. It will not be soon forgotten, uh, either by us or by the world. It was indeed an extraordinary year. In this country, of course, there were raging bushfires and other natural disasters that brought climate change to the fore in international and local forums. And most of the news I'm hearing right now is about Joe Biden going to deal with climate change and how that's going to put pressure on the Australian government to, to deal with climate change, as they call it. So it was partly our bushfires that brought that about. Of course, the global COVID-19 pandemic has wrecked economies and closed down normal life. I don't think we're ever going to get back to normal life, uh, the way things are going. The untimely deaths of African Americans at the hands of law enforcement officers resulted, of course, in worldwide calls for change. There was a little war in a place called Nagorno-Karabakh, which erupted in September, that plays an important part in Bible prophecy, which is one of the reasons why we read Ezekiel 38. We want to deal with that this evening a little later on. Vladimir Putin consolidated his power in Russia, and we'll deal with that briefly in a moment. And former enemies of Israel, many of whom had sought to destroy that nation for seven decades, suddenly changed their mind. Well, they didn't suddenly change their mind. It's been changed over the last couple of years, few years. And, of course, we had the Abraham Accord uh, in 2020. And little Lebanon. We've got people who are very interested in Lebanon in this ecclesia. Little Lebanon suffered dreadfully. And we'll deal with a little bit about that later on as well and see why that's happening, because it's part of the angelic work to bring to pass the fulfilment of Bible prophecy. The year ended as it began. It was bookended by several significant events that framed its legacy. China, the source of the coronavirus, became the focus of criticism from other nations, including Australia, triggering pushback from China. And we know the results of that. Australia has been forced to look to trade elsewhere and Britain has come into strong focus, as we'll consider a little later on, all in accordance with the requirements of Bible prophecy. So if you thought that the things that are happening in relation to China were insignificant, you were wrong, because they're very significant in pushing Australia and other countries into the arms of Britain rather than to the east. 
The assassination of powerful Iranians, Soleimani on the 3rd of January last year, and Moshin Fakhrizadeh on the 27th of November, so it's either end of the year, has shaped the future of Middle East diplomacy for years to come. We were all familiar with those scenes that came from the east coast of this country. A perfect storm of extended drought, extreme temperature, tempestuous winds resulted in these unprecedented bushfires on the east of Australia. I want to go on and talk just about one or two of the things that we've mentioned briefly at the start. And then we're going to get into Ezekiel 38. Let's just have a look at this Black Lives Matter protests that are going around the world. The, the Swedes have recently nominated the Black Lives uh, Matters uh, movement for uh, an award. And they might even get, of course, that famous award that the Swedes have been issuing for a long time. Now, that's amazing, really, when you think about that. Uh, protests quickly became riots with looting and arson in many cities. And those protests persisted for many months with demands for complete change. And part of that demand included the immediate defunding of police departments. Well, that would be great, wouldn't it, to have no police on the street? But that's what they were demanding, the, the, the defunding of police departments in America. The revision of history and, of course, the toppling and demolition of statues of anybody that had any connection at all uh, with slavery. International reverberations persist around the world. But, of course, some of that was overtaken by the pandemic. And fearful of a repeat of the Spanish flu in 1918, when 40 million plus died from that flu, by mid-March, much of the world was in lockdown due to the rapid spread of COVID-19. By the end of January 2021, which is today, 100 plus million people have contracted COVID-19 around the world. And 2.14 million people have died thus far. Some countries are in real trouble. The, the virus is out of control, for example, in the United States of America. It has had 25 million cases, and there are now over 400,000 deaths from COVID-19. In a few countries, like Australia and New Zealand, it's been largely suppressed. So we're living in, as they call it, the lucky country in that regard. We can be very thankful about that. The loss of travel, commerce and incomes beckon, of course, a global depression. So I want to start tonight in Luke chapter 17, if you can turn up there with me. Because you see, this, this pandemic is just another thing that the angels are using, I believe, to bring about the Great Depression of the 21st century. And it's coming. They know it's coming. And our Lord Jesus Christ warned us that we should be ready for it, because we're not going to have to endure it, but we are going to be removed to judgment prior to it. And he makes it very plain in Luke chapter 17, and we're, we're very familiar with this passage, aren't we? Luke chapter 17 and verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. And I'll give you the way that the literal Greek is. They were eating, they were drinking. So we have here the, the plural imperfect. In other words, an activity that's begun but is not completed. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying wives, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But the same day Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. The next verse is very important. Verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now the world's been curtailed from some of those things, a little bit, hasn't it? But they want to get back to it, and they're climbing back to it. As soon as they open the hotels, they're back there in multitudes. Yeah, they'll get back to it when there's any freedom to do so. 
And what the Lord is telling us, brothers and sisters and young people, is this. Just like Noah and his family were locked away in the ark, and then all the prosperity of their time collapsed in a day or a week. And just like the angels came and whipped Lot and his family out of Sodom, and their prosperity disappeared that day, so it will be for you and me. And the world knows it's coming. They know that there is a Great Depression coming. They've been talking about it now for years. Only reason it hasn't come is it's not God's timing. And when it is God's timing, it will happen. And COVID is going to make a huge contribution to that collapse. There's a lot of companies in this world that are teetering on the verge of collapse. And when they go down, and when the stock markets go down, the whole thing will go over the edge. So we need to be aware that what we're seeing is part of the angelic activity to produce that kind of outcome. And we need to be ready because Lot's wife wasn't ready. That's why he says, remember Lot's wife. She was too integrated into the society of her time and she could not really leave it behind. So these two eras of time are chosen specifically because they have that common denominator of times of prosperity. And it's a fascinating fact that you will not read here in the words of Christ about violence and immorality. He makes no mention of those two things. Why not? Weren't they going to happen? Well, of course they've happened. Of course we've got the days of Noah and the days of Lot in terms of violence, immorality. But he's not concerned too much about that. He's concerned about you and me being caught up in the life of the modern world, like Lot's wife. That's his real concern. The day will come. He will come to raise the dead. It's not too far away. And then will come that time of trouble such as never was. And I'm not going to take you there, but jot down Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And when you get there, if you haven't highlighted this little phrase in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, do so. It's the phrase... And at that time, this is what it says. And at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. And at that time there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation on earth. And at that time many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Did I get that close? Right. What's the point of it? The point is this, that the resurrection of the dead and the beginning of the time of trouble are concomitant events. Concomitant means they happen at the same time. And that's when the time of trouble will begin. It's not going to be a very nice time. If they think they've had a bad time with COVID-19, watch out, because there's a much worse time coming when we are removed to the judgment seat of Christ. And then further down the track will come Armageddon, which will sweep away all of the things in which man puts his trust and his confidence. So let's then go back to Ezekiel 38. But what I want to do in Ezekiel 38 is demonstrate that almost everything, if not everything, in those 13 verses that we read this evening are either in place or beginning to happen, clearly beginning to happen. And that tells us how close we are to the return of Christ. So I want to take you through it. So what does Ezekiel 38 require? Let's just summarise those first 13 verses. Well, in verses 1 and 2, it requires that a dictator dominate the entire Eurasian continent. Eurasian means, of course, Asia and Europe. It requires, in verses 5 and 6 that the territory east and north of Israel be under Gogian control. In verse 6, that a dependent Europe will fall under Gog's political control without the need for conquest. It requires in verse 8 that the West Bank, which was supposedly supposed to be a Palestinian state, remember, that's all gone out the window now, it requires that the West Bank be part of Israel proper that is owned and controlled by Israel. It requires in verses 8 to 11 
that Israel be, will be at peace both internally and with its near neighbours and have no fear and can take down uh, their walls and their bars and their gates, etc. It requires in verse 12 that Israel be very prosperous and be envied by other nations and be the object of their desire. In verse 13, it requires that Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states will be the first cabs off the rank to object to the Gogian invasion of the land. Not Britain, not Australia, but Sheba and Dedan. That's why they're mentioned first. The first to object. And then Britain and its young lions will follow suit. Okay? That's what the first 13 verses of Ezekiel 38 tell us has to happen. And as I said to you, much of that is either in place, I believe, or happening. We want to go through that in a little bit of detail. In verse 2, of course, we have those words, Gog of the land of Magog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. So there's Rotherham, a fairly literal translation, and the Amplified Bible. A little bit looser, but you'll see the words are almost identical. So we know that that's what it says, the Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And we know that Jesenius points out that this name, Rosh, mentioned here with Tubal and Meshach, is undoubtedly the Russians. He talks about them being called the Rus. And they initially, of course, inhabited, he says, this area uh, along the river Ra or Volga. And the river Volga, as you can see, runs into the Caspian Sea. And where you have the word Rosh, you'll notice it concludes uh, Belarus and the Ukraine. Been a few problems in Belarus, isn't there? 2020, I wonder why. Well, because you see it's going to be absorbed very soon into Putin's Russian empire. And of course, Ukraine's been an issue for some time. Why would that be a part of Putin's desire? Well, this is where the original Russian kingdom was. This was where their empire was. And he is determined to redevelop the Russian empire of old. And you can't have an empire rebuilt unless you've got its heartland, its homeland. That's why he wants the Ukraine. And when he gets it, brothers and sisters, we will have Gog of the land of Magog. Because there's Magog, this section. All right? Gog of the land of Magog. It's happening before our very eyes. and It's been happening for a few years now. This man is glued to the throne, according to this Economist article in January last year. Preparing to rule forever. I've got news for him. There's only one man who will rule for a thousand years, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. But he wants to rule forever. In his State of the Union speech, he announced a radical overhaul of the Russian constitution, and within hours, Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev resigned along with the entire cabinet to make way for Putin to get his will. He's 67 years of age, he is healthy, he's the wealthiest and most powerful man in the world. There's no question about that. He fits all the requirements of Gog and may well prove to be the Gog. Only time will tell. He can rule now that the constitution was changed last year. He can rule until 2036. That's 16 years away. I think that's adequate time for what we're looking for. So I think this man may well be the one we have been looking for. The Russian Orthodox Church fully backs Putin and has pushed for him to be made Tsar Vladimir II because Putin's hero just happens to be Tsar Vladimir I. And Tsar Vladimir I ruled from Kiev, which was the first capital of the Russian Empire. He wants it. He wants the Ukraine. And if he gets it, and he's, he's a Tsar, Brother Thomas will be proved right again. He said a Tsar of all the Russias will be the goad that comes down upon the mountains of Israel. In his 2021 State of the Union speech, Putin warned the world is on the brink of global conflict. Yeah, and he's right. In June last year, the Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill consecrated a cathedral dedicated to the armed forces, built to mark Victory Day in the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II 
in Europe. That reminded me of Joel chapter 3 and verse 9. You know what it says? The margin of my Bible says, for the word prepare, it says sanctify. Sanctify war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. You know, they built a cathedral to sanctify war. And of course, we know they're preparing for it assiduously. So let's move on. We've, we've had a look briefly at, at verse 2 of Ezekiel 38. Let's come down to verses 5 to 7 of Ezekiel 38. Now, I haven't got time to talk too much about Persia, the first name mentioned. But when you read that word Persia, brothers and sisters, it's not talking about Iran specifically. Iran's included. It's talking about the Persia of Ezekiel's era. It went from Syria to the Indus River in Pakistan. So when you read Persia there, you've got to read Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and at least half of Pakistan. That's the Persia that he's referring to. Now, there's a lot of things happening in those nations, which would take me another full session to talk about. One point can be mentioned, and it is this. The Russians have already got a stranglehold on the Iranian oil supplies. Did you know that? The law of the Caspian Sea in 2018 saw Russia steal $2.3 trillion of Iranian oil. And when Iran was in trouble because of the American uh, imposition of sanctions through Trump withdrawing from the agreement in 2018, he withdrew and he put on sanctions, the Russians said, we'll give you some financial support. But there was a quid pro quo. You know what that was? Seven Russian companies will take over seven of the most important oil fields in Iran. Oh, and there's an extra. The extra is that Russia got a port on the Persian Gulf and the military air base next door. They're there. They're there already. It will not be long. And they will take political control of that country, put their own ruler in power, just like Alexander the Great used to do. Put their own ruler in power and control it. That's what's happening in Iran. And a lot of other things are happening in that region that I'm not going to talk about tonight. But I'm going to deal with some of the other ones briefly. Ethiopia, of course, and Libya. We'll come to them in a minute. But what about Goma? Well, we're not going to say too much about Western Europe, but the the Galatians or Gauls who migrated west to France, Holland and Belgium, of course, represent the nations of Western Europe, uh, who, of course, we know will be in lockstep uh, with Russia when they come down upon the land. A lot could be said about that we won't worry about. But I'm going to talk a bit about this one. This is Tagama. Now, Tagama represents the countries due north of Israel. That's why it says there. It says in verse 6, the house of Tagama of the north quarters. So it's directly to the north of Israel. It represents the, the country, the, the area of eastern Turkey, or otherwise known as Kurdistan, and especially Armenia. I want to talk about Armenia a little later on because there was a war in which the Armenians were involved over Nagorno-Karabakh. It's playing a part in the fulfilment of Bible prophecy. We know what that Next verse says, verse 7, Be thou prepared, Gog, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. And that's a very interesting word, isn't it? In the Hebrew, the word mishmar means the guard of a prison. Jesenia says it means a custodian. And that's, of course, exactly what Putin does. He puts nations in, the, in his debt, and then he rules them Sometimes, you know, from afar, but he rules them because he got his own people in power. He'll do that to all of those nations that are described there as Persia, from Syria right across to, Af to uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So what about Turkey and Russia? Well, Russia and Turkey are now on different sides in two Middle East wars. You might recall that on the 24th of November 2015, the Turks shot down a Russian jet bomber over the Syrian border, which led to a cold war between those two nations, and borders were closed for some time. When Turkey turned to the US for help, Putin repaired the relationship, even supplying the brand new S-400 missile system. 
which of course can take down planes for hundreds of kilometres. The US then abandoned the supply of the S-35 jet fighter to Turkey because Turkey is a NATO member and they don't want the S-35 getting into the hands of people who can pass on its secrets to the Russians. So the US got out. Now, this also has brought about, uh, I think, a very significant event, which we'll deal with a little later on. And in late 2019, Turkey reacted to Putin's broken promises on Syria. And in fact, they thought war might break out between Turkey and Russia over Syria and the last enclave of resistance uh, to Assad. And this is what commentators are saying about Turkey. Turkey is in rapid decline. This article said, Turkey's expansionism in the eastern Mediterranean and the wider Middle East is coming to an end on all fronts. After a decade of interference in other countries and military operations in Syria, Iraq and Libya, a new regional balance is gradually taking shape with Turkey's influence slowly but steadily receding. Turkey's maximalist aspirations have become empty rhetoric, said this article, and went on to make the statement that President Erdogan has continued to act provocatively against the interests of major Mediterranean actors and has alienated every former ally of the past. You know, so Turkey's becoming very isolated. And of course, they're a sitting duck when the time comes for Russia to move in and take it. But I, I just want to make this comment. Russia will not do that, brothers and sisters and young people, until they become the king of the north. You know what you've got to have? What territory you have to possess to be called, biblically, the king of the north? You have to have from Syria to the Indus River. Because that was the territory of the Seleucid kingdom, called the king of the north, in Daniel chapter 11. Well, they've already done pretty well in Syria, haven't they? And they're playing in every one of those nations right now, including Pakistan. Because you remember Trump cut off the Pakistanis? He said, you're, you're assisting the Mujahideen against Americans. So he cut off money. Within a day, within a day, Putin was on the phone to the Pakistani Prime Minister and said, don't worry, we'll help. Yeah, they're going to help, all right. Because they have to have control of that old Seleucid kingdom. And when they've got it, then they can be called the King of the North, and then they can invade and take Constantinople, but not before. So what else are they doing? Well, we mentioned there Ethiopia and Libya. Let's have a look at Libya. Libya, of course, is still going through a civil war. The first one was in 2011, when Muammar Gaddafi was assassinated or killed. The second one began in 2014 and is ongoing today. Russia is supporting the strong man who controls this pink territory in the east of Libya. Haftar is his name. He's worn out the red carpet in Moscow. He's been there that many times. The Russians have supported him. Even when he was actually withdrawing from a recent attack last year, the Russians sent unpainted fighters jet fighters to protect his forces as they retreated with Russian pilots. This green area is controlled by the recognised government, the UN recognised government uh, of Libya. That country is in an awful state. And eventually, with Russian assistance, the strong man in the east will rule that country. And that's why they will be in debt to Russia. That's why they'll be part of the confederacy that comes uh, down upon Israel and into the Middle East. So we know, we know that the events in Libya for the last few years, awful as they are, are designed by God to bring about a fulfilment of Bible prophecy. What about, what about Ethiopia here? Well, the word in the Hebrew is Cush, and there are three Cushes in the Bible. There's the original one in Genesis 2, which of course is where Iraq is today. There's the one mentioned in, in Numbers chapter 12 because Moses married a Cushite or an Ethiopian. All right, that's in the area of what we would call today the Sinai Peninsula. And there's another one, the one where in Acts chapter 8, remember, the Ethiopian eunuch came from and he was baptised in the wilderness of Judea. That Cush is Sudan. Now, it might include part of what we call Ethiopia today and Eritrea but it's essentially the country to the due south of Egypt. It's Sudan. 
and a lot of important things are happening in Sudan. They've just joined the Abraham Accord. But really, deep down, they hate Israel. And in actual fact, the, uh, the, the change, the shift in power when Bashir was removed a couple of years ago saw a slowing down of what we were hoping for. But just about four weeks ago, the, the Sudanese government authorised the go-ahead on a naval base in the Red Sea, a Russian naval base in the Red Sea. They've already got a military base, by the way, in Sudan. Now they're going to have a naval base. Their prophecy is coming to pass. So we've got Libya and Ethiopia. What else have we got in this verse here, verse 6 of Ezekiel 38? Well, we've got Tagama. So I asked this question, why was renewed warfare over Nagorno-Karabakh significant, do you think? And the answer is that Armenia, which controls or did control the enclave, is the biblical Tagama. Let's just have a little bit of the history. In 1922, Armenia was incorporated into the USSR and in 1936 became a separate Soviet Socialist Republic within the USSR. In 1993, Armenian forces defeated the Azerbaijani army, that's their next door neighbours, in several conflicts which led to Armenian control of an enclave called Nagorno-Karabakh and its adjacent areas to the west. War erupted again last year on the 27th of September and it ended within six weeks. You know, it just sort of passed by. But Bible students knew the importance of it. Because you see, we've got Tagama involved here. Putin imposed a ceasefire on the 10th of November that cost Armenia dearly. And initially there were riots in the streets of Yerevan, their capital. But then it all quietened down. I wonder why it all quietened down. Well, there would have been some assurances given by Vladimir Putin. He has a very close relationship with the president of Armenia, both this one and the former one. Russia has been supplying weapons to Armenia since 2004. They also supply Azerbaijan. So they had a problem, didn't they? Well, it's not a problem for Putin, because you see he has plans. And I want to show you what his plans are. So you know where Nagorno-Karabakh is? Well, here's a map. This is eastern Turkey. There's Armenia, very small country, as we'll show in a minute why. Then you've got this shaded area, which is actually Azerbaijan, this area here. All right. This shaded area was, was controlled since 1993 by Armenia. It wasn't their territory. This enclave, this one here in colour, is Nagorno-Karabakh. It used to be basically Armenian inhabitants. They've all left. Now Azerbaijanis are going in there. Now you'd think the loss of that would be a horrible thing to happen to any government. So why is the government still in power? Some assurances have been given. Doubtless. So who is Tagama? Well, if you go to the commentators, Keel and Daly say, Tagama is the name of the Armenians who are still called the House of Thorgum or Torkamatsi. Okay, so this is the area. There are Kurds in here as well. Now Kurds, by the way, are the Chaldeans. They're the descendants of the Chaldeans. So we've still got history in this region. So this area of Armenia has a history of itself. The Turkish genocide of the Armenian race from 1915 to 1922 resulted in 1.5 million people dying and the seizure of 80% of Armenian land. Now you might be able to see, probably from the back you need binoculars, here there's Armenia, that's pretty easy to see, it's red. You see this red line around here? That was the historic Armenia up to 1922. They also had this area down here, they called it Little Armenia. From 1100 AD, they controlled that area, Cilicia, which is where, of course, the Apostle Paul was born. So all of this territory was taken from them by the Turks. About 80% of their territory was ripped away from them between 1915 and 1922. And the Armenians, of course, want it back, obviously. I wonder who's going to give it back to them. Well, there are two very powerful men working on their side. One of them is Vladimir Putin. And I'm sure he's following up on what was published, set forth on Russian television in 2000 and... 
18. This is what they said. Notice this map. Now, it's a bit hard to actually see the boundaries. You see this area here of green? Up here, that's eastern Turkey. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, western Turkey. So this is, the, this is Turkey here. What you've got up there is the area around Constantinople, or Istanbul, as it's called today. And they made the point. Uh, Constantinople, or Istanbul, and the Turkish Strait, should be Russian. And this is on Russian television. So they're, they're signalling what they intend to do. And they also say about this region, which you'll see is actually Armenia, uh, Western Armenia and Mount Ararat should belong to Russia as well. I mean, it's on television. So they're telling the world what they propose to do. They're going to seize that territory. And the other very powerful man who's supporting that proposal is this man, the Pope. Because he went to Armenia in 2016, as you can see from the Guardian article. Pope Francis denounces Armenian genocide during visit to Yerevan. He ad-libbed controversial word, uh, genocide, during speech to devotees, risking repeated diplomatic rift between Turkey and the Vatican. Yeah, I think he would have made some assurances too. Now, why did he go there? Well, because you see, the Armenians are not Muslims. The Turks are largely Muslim. The Armenians are Orthodox Christians. That's why he went there. He's protecting his turf. And of course, it's obvious what's going to happen in due time. Those Armenians will get their land back when Russia deals with Turkey. They'll get their land back and we'll have our Tagama. So it might have passed many people by, but it's a significant event that happened last year in relation to Bible prophecy. And another one is in verse 8 of Ezekiel 38. It's the West Bank to become part of Israel. And you read there, of course, towards the, the middle of the verse, you read, against the mountains of Israel. So God comes against what's called the mountains of Israel, not the mountains of Palestine. They wanted to make this territory, of course, a Palestinian state. 90% of the mountains of Israel from down here in the Negev up to uh, the area of, of Jezreel, the valley of Jezreel, and of course uh, this area is nearly all mountainous. 90% of the mountains of Israel are in the West Bank. That's telling us something. It's telling us that that portion of land has to become part of Israel proper. And if that's not enough evidence, then verse 12 adds to it. Because the last line of verse 12 says this, the, the people of Israel dwell in what's called the midst of the land. And the word in the Hebrew means the navel. Where's your navel? I know where mine is. It's right in the middle, right? Right in the middle of the land. And so we know that that is going to become part of Israel proper in due time. The Likud decision on the 31st of December 2017 at 11.45pm that night sealed its fate they decided that they would begin the process of annexing parts and then the whole of the West Bank. It had the support of Trump's uh, appointed ambassador to Israel, who was also a Jew, David Friedman, who supported part uh, of the West Bank becoming part of Israel. And of course, it's been pushed by America up to the time of Trump's removal. Israel intended to begin annexing parts of the West Bank on the 1st of July 2020. But the plan has been postponed due to the Abraham Accord. The Prime Minister Netanyahu has made it very clear. He has confirmed that the pause is only temporary. And you know, it's all because prophecy requires it. It requires it here in Ezekiel 38 verse 8. But there are other prophecies that also require that any Palestinian state not be in that place. See those two references there. Now, what we have on the screen here goes back to 2017. So it's a little bit old, but it's very relevant. Because what it's telling us is that Saudi Arabia, under Prince Mohammed bin Salman, has changed its policy towards a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. And because the prince called Plan A, which was this, as being dead... It is necessary to move forward, said this article, to plan B, 
And plan B is essentially as follows. The state of Palestine would be established in the Gaza Strip, plus large tracts of territory to be annexed from northern Sinai, and apparently Egypt had agreed to that outline. So that was back three or four years ago. Now, have a look at those two uh, passages you can see on the screen there. Joel chapter 3 verse 4 and Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 4 to 7. Joel chapter 3, we are very familiar with it. It, of course, is the Armageddon chapter, isn't it? It's got the Gogian host coming down into the land of Israel to the valley of Jehoshaphat uh, in verse uh, 2. And then we read some of the events surrounding that day. Verse 4. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre, which of course is where the Hezbollah are today, and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Now that's all I'm going to read, because that's all I want. We know the context. We know it's about the invasion of the land. And this is what God says about what had preceded that invasion, how they had dealt with his people. And we read here of the coasts of Palestine. Now, the one thing the West Bank doesn't have is a coastline. The closest it gets is nine miles, all right? And whatever that is in kilometres. Nine miles from the Mediterranean coast to the, to the Green Line. It does not have a coastline. The second reference says the same thing. Joel, uh, sorry, Zephaniah chapter 2 uh, and verses 4 to 7. It's also important always to have your context straight. So let's get our context straight. This is what verse 11 says in Zephaniah chapter 2. Yahweh will be, a ter will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth. Now how do you famish the gods of the earth? Well, you starve them. You starve them of their devotees, of people who worship them. You change their minds so they don't worship those gods anymore. So you starve the gods to death, so to speak. He goes on to say this. And every man and, and men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the nations. So what's our context, do you think? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? The setting up of the kingdom of God. So here we've got God's kingdom established. We've got all the idols of the world removed. That's your context. So step back to verse 4. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a, a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Kerathites. Now, you know who Kerathites were? They were Philistines. Yeah, David had a little private army of Kerathites that defended him. Goes on to say, The word of Yahweh is against you, O Canaan, of the land of the Philistines, as it should read. Palestine, of course, comes from the word Philistine. So what is that telling you? Well, it's got a sea coast, hasn't it? Yeah, I think this might come to pass. If there is a Palestinian state, it will be in the Gaza Strip, because that does have a coastline. But the West Bank doesn't. So we've seen some remarkable things happening in that regard in the last little while. The Muslim world, of course, as you know, is deeply divided between Sunni and Shia. This map shows you, in the dark and lighter blue colours, the Sunni domination of the Muslim world. We have a few 250 million to the north of Australia. This is the Sunni domination of the Muslim world. The green and lighter green represents Sunnis. And of course, Iran is 100% Sunni. Iraq is 60% Sunni, uh, so I should say Shia. So Iran is 100% Shia, and Iraq is 60% Shia. And they hate each other with a passion. And that's what's brought about the huge changes in the, in the Middle East in the last 10 years or so. As Iran has tried to interfere in the affairs of surrounding nations, and the Saudi Arabians and the Gulf states have become very, very concerned about that. And they know, as Prince Mohammed bin Salman said when he was the defence minister of Saudi Arabia, because he had a look at his forces, they know that if there was a war between Saudi Arabia 
and Iran, Iran would win. Unless, unless Saudi Arabia had Israel, <coughs> Israel on its side. And that's why things have changed. They are getting the support of Israel against Iran. Now, verse 13 of Ezekiel 38, let's come back to it, is very important. Ezekiel 38, verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Gog, art thou come to take a spoil, etc.? So Sheba and Dedan, who are they? Well, we know who they are. We know, of course, that, that Tarshish is clearly a reference to Britain, come to that in a minute. But Sheba and Dedan are the first to object to the Gogin invasion. Well, modern Yemen is Sheba. Look at the old maps. Kingdom of Sheba, here, all right? So here is your Saudi Arabian Peninsula, all right? This area of Yemen is the kingdom of Sheba. And the Queen of Sheba came, of course, to Solomon. Dedan is over here, and of course it incorporates, as we shall see in a minute, it incorporates these Gulf states, Oman, right through to the UAE. So this is the Sheba and the Dedan of the Bible. And we know that Oman has taken early steps. Way back in 2018, they were taking early steps towards being involved in... Uh, and having Israel on their side. And the report, the report was very, very plain about that. So here's Yeshiba, Yemen. That's why awful things have been happening there for a long time. It's the worst place in the world to live, by the way. They've got starvation. They've got COVID. They've got daily warfare. There are people dying in their squillions in, in Yemen. It's an awful place to be. Why? Why all the heartache? Well, because God wants them in the camp of Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are in there trying to sort out the hoodie rebels who are supported by Iran. That's why there's so much pain and heartache. All right? So th this is the report that, that in 2018 in the Jerusalem Post. Oman publicly called on Middle East countries to accept Israel after Prime Minister Netanyahu had been there. Got a picture? You can see why the Abraham Accord eventually came, came to pass in 2020. And there they are. There's the leaders of America at the time, Donald Trump, of Benjamin Netanyahu to his right, then the two chief ministers of the UAE and Bahrain. A, isn't it incredible? They should call it the Abraham Accord? They, we marvel at it, don't we? So here we've got the angels at work. That's why Trump was in office for four years. He did his job. He was no longer required Biden can't turn that around. There's no way he can ever turn that around. So Trump did his job, uh, and of course, he's gone. God has used him for a purpose. Israeli media reports that this agreement was brokered by Jared Kushner, the Jewish son-in-law, of course, of Donald Trump, Mossad chief Yossi Cohen, and others. But foremost, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, ruler of the UAE, United Arab Emirates, has boldly led the Middle East into what will not just realign the region's geopolitics, but quite likely those of the world. I don't know what they're saying, do they? Because it's exactly right. It will realign everything. As per the agreements, the UAE and Bahrain will establish embassies, exchange ambassadors, cooperate and work together with Israel across a range of sectors, including tourism, trade, healthcare and security. And Netanyahu, described it as the pivot of history, this Abraham Accord. So prophecy requires Sheba, or Yemen, and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the Gulf states to be supportive allies of Israel at the time of the Gogian invasion. And this is what he said. You have heard from the president, meaning Trump, that he has already lined up more and more countries. This was unimaginable a few years ago. But with resolve, determination, a fresh look at the way peace is done, this is being achieved. He said, he missed out one thing. He missed out the activity of the angels who have been sent to accomplish this result. You know, even in Saudi Arabia, they're preparing their people to have normalization of ties with Israel. This article was about a sermon that was delivered by a very important uh, Muslim uh, cleric. 
It says, has Saudi Arabia begun preparing its people for normalisation with Israel? A sermon delivered on Friday by Abdul Rahman al sadais the imam of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, has been interpreted by some Arabs and Muslims as a prelude to normalisation with Israel. In his sermon, Sudeas said that Islam requires Muslims to respect non-Muslims and treat them well. You know, they've been doing this in universities in Saudi Arabia for the last three or four years. Did you also know that they actually have been showing on Saudi Arabian television documentaries on the history of Israel and how Israel came into existence? Yeah, they've been doing that in Saudi Arabia because they're trying to change, of course, that mentality, the, the NASA uh, mentality of the 1960s and 70s, which brought about war between Israel and its Arab neighbours so many times. Netanyahu, however, and the Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo at the time met in the western Saudi town of Neom on the 22nd of November 2020 to discuss progress towards normalisation of relationships. Now, that's after the election. Trump already knew, he didn't agree, but he already knew that he wasn't going to be president in January. So he was out there. He was out there working hard to make sure that other Arab countries like Saudi Arabia join the Abraham Accord. Now, do you recall I mentioned something about the importance of what's been happening in Turkey? Well, the US is thinking about moving its highly strategic air base from Incelik in Turkey to somewhere else. Because, of course, Turkey's a NATO member, but they are in hot. They've got the Russian S-400 missile system, and that's very dangerous to NATO. So they've been discussing where to go. Crete? Greece? Well, there's been talks about all of that. But there's something else happening on the table. Parallel talks are also in progress between Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed and the Pentagon on a new home for the US Turkish air base to territory controlled by the United Arab Emirates, namely the south coast of Yemen, including Socrata, uh, Soc Socotra Island, which the UAE has taken over. So, you know, even that, even the air base that's in Turkey, so important, could end up being in Yemen. It's amazing, isn't it, the way that the angels are at work. You know, I mentioned the two assassinations, the book ended the year. Very, very important. The article that this came from said the head of the oct octopus had been cut off. Soleimani was the most powerful, second most powerful man in Iran, behind the old Ayatollah. He was the brains behind the use of the terrorist organisations like Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, the Houthi in Yemen, and the pro-Assad militias in Syria. His death has weakened them all, as prophecy requires. So the Americans got him on the 3rd of January, and the Israelis got this man, on the 27th of November. This man was the head of the Iranian nuclear organisation. He was the brains behind it. So they got rid of him by an attack, a marvellous attack, apparently, uh, you know, with all of their technology. They are suspected of it, and of course, US officials have basically confirmed that they, the Israelis, were involved. The Biden administration will need to carefully consider the consequences of trying to renew the US commitment to the Six Nation nuclear deal which Trump withdrew from in 2018. Because you see, Iran has broken the terms of that commitment. And to go back into that would make it very, very dangerous for Biden and America. So they're probably not going to be able to turn that one around either. Israel, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states will vigorously oppose any such move by America, which may contribute to the breakdown of the relationship between those countries. But one thing is for sure. The death of Soleimani was an enormous bonus for Israel towards peace. Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthi in Yemen, Assad's Syrian militias and the Hamas in Gaza 
have had much of their financial and logistical support from Iran curtailed. And of course the organisational ability of Soleimani has now gone as well. Saudi Arabia, Oman and other Gulf states are seeking closer ties with Israel because of Iran and are remarkably quiet about the West Bank. In 2020, the US put increased pressure on the Gulf states to make peace with Israel and it's going to happen because Bible prophecy says it will. Verses 8 to 11 of Ezekiel 38 make that very clear. Well, what about little Lebanon as we come towards the end? You've all seen that picture, haven't you? Yeah, well, this is what happened. It blew up that store of very, very dangerous materials in the port of Beirut blew up. Over 200 people died. And, of course, a good proportion of that city was destroyed. But, you see, Lebanon was actually a failed country before that happened. They were on the verge of collapse because of the, the foolishness of the government system that they had. There were street riots in late 2019 that were largely ignored by the Lebanese government as people cried out for change. And Hezbollah dominates that government but is now held responsible for that huge blast. And it wasn't too long before Netanyahu got onto t to television in Israel and beamed it into, into Lebanon, pointing out that the Mossad had found other secret sites within Beirut right up against uh, public housing, housing of people that were in danger of also exploding at some point. Because that's where they hide, you know, that's where they go. They go amongst the people so that Israel won't bomb them. And there's a great deal of danger uh, for the inhabitants of that country because of the activities of Hezbollah. That trend, of course, is exactly what we no prophecy requires. Israel has to be at peace with all its neighbours and it cannot be at peace with Lebanon while Hezbollah are in, in, in control in that country. They will have to be removed uh, like the PLO was removed in the 70s and 80s. Well, where are we up to? This is the Queen sitting down, signing legislation to confirm Brexit having finally come to reality, here she is signing it off, right? just like our Governor-General signs off the legislation passed in the Parliament, she signed it off. What a remarkable thing that is, eh? We've finally got Brexit. And meanwhile, while well, all this is happening, of course, CANZUC is progressing. So what's CANZUC? The acronym stands for Canada, Australia, New Zealand and United Kingdom. This article pointed out that in the aftermath of the British exit from the EU, the concept of CANZUC, a largely economic alliance between Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, all of which have the monarchy, the same common law systems and parliamentary democracy, among others, is telling us, isn't it, that Ezekiel 38 verse 13 is coming to pass. You know what it says? Read what it says, brothers and sisters, in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the, what does it say? Merchants of Tarshish. There has to be a strong trading relationship between Britain and its former colonies. The removal of Britain from the EU, even though they've got an agreement to continue trade, is going to lead eventually, because that relationship will fall down, we know that, eventually, it will lead to much stronger trading relationships between those countries that are part of Kenzuk. It's gaining momentum. It did in 2020 as the UK faced a no-deal Brexit and is now being pursued vigorously. So there it is, Ezekiel 38 listed. And we know, of course, that Tarshish can be shown by scripture and by history to be Britain, Baratanic, the land of tin. Brother Thomas makes it very clear in his writings that Britain has no part uh, in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Very, very clear about that. So here is a First World War poster, and you can see, of course, what we have here is the young lions who answer the call. You've all seen this before. 
Australia, Canada, India and New Zealand all have a British system of government and three share the Queen as titular head of state. And events in 2020 have forced all of those nations to rebuild their trading relationship after decades of minimal trade with Britain. It's a bit exhausting, isn't it? We could say a whole lot more, but we're not going to do that. I'm going to finish with this verse. Is this true, do you think? Revelation 11, verse 18. The nations were angry. They can't even agree about supply of vaccinations for COVID. The nations are angry. And thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. A word that, that word destroy means to rot thoroughly. And mankind has done that both physically to the earth and morally. And the day of reckoning is about to dawn. You and I, brothers and sisters, need to be ready for that day. But if you think it's going on for too long, hearken to the prophet Habakkuk. Wait for it. Because it will surely come it will not tarry, and events are telling us that it is not tarrying. Brothers and sisters, let's be aware, aware of where we sit in the scheme of things and make this year, 2021, a year of preparation, because we might not get to the end of it. Well, what extremely exciting times we live in here. And I'd like to thank Brother Jim for his enthusiasm and his time and work and he's put into tonight. So thank you very much. I'm just going to run through the announcements for the coming week. Some of the announcements for the coming week will take place, God willing. Uh, firstly, next week's B is a series defending the faith and we've particularly looking at rested scriptures, immortality of the soul. So um, a lot of the Sunday School students were given their own copy of rested scriptures, so please bring those along and we'll be studying the immortality of the soul. And the speaker will be Brother Matt Petit and chairs Chris Laurie, Rita Nathan Jolly, uh, Piano Ali Oliver, streaming L Lewis Luke. Uh, supper coordinators for that night, Ian and Mary Wigsell, Hayden and Dee, and the Red Group. Thank you. Tuesday night seminars start back at the hall, and we're starting off. Uh, Brother Tim Colliver will be running through five reasons to trust the Bible. Now, some of you might have missed the, the link that was in the newsletter, um, but if you have, go back to the newsletter and Click on that link under the section Tuesday night and then you can forward that little video to any friends that you do have that might be interested. And it's a great little um, video that advertises the first two Tuesday night classes. And it's new year, new you, new seminars, same God. Also, there is some leftover subways, so feel free to take some on the way home. Um, they've been put on ice, and uh, it'll be good for the kids' lunches. Thank you, everyone, and we'll just conclude by singing hymn 284, followed by prayer.
our loving, merciful God. Thank you for your word of prophecy, which gives us hope and confidence. For we know that this world offers none. The world is in turmoil around us with increasing hate and fear. How blessed we are to be able to be protected by your overshadowing care. For if you are for us, who can be against us? Help us in these last days to prepare our hearts to meet our Lord and Saviour. Help us to look up and lift up our heads. Please, please send your son soon, if it be according to your will. For the world is degenerating and evil and bring us down at times. We long for his return so that the dead are raised and we meet with them and our Lord. We are so thankful for the wonderful hope you give us. We leave our lives in your care, giving praise to your great name and ask this prayer through earth's future king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.